So the question I want to ask you this morning is this. Who is in charge? Who's in charge? Who calls the shots? Who has the final say? Who is the final authority in your life? Well, as you're pondering that, uh, I don't know if you've uh, ever seen it, but there's this story that appears on social media feeds from time to time. I mean, it certainly appeared on mine just this last week. And it recounts a supposed incident off the coast of Newfoundland, Canada, between an aircraft carrier and the Canadian Coast Guard. And the radio discussion goes something like this. This is A835 speaking. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. You are heading directly towards us. To which the aircraft carrier replies, I recommend you divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid diversion, uh, collision. Negative. You will have to divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. The uh, captain getting a bit irate now. This is Captain Johnson of the US Navy. I insist that you divert your course 15 degrees to the north. I'm afraid that's just not possible. So again, please divert your course 15 degrees south. Well, now we get to see the weight of the American Air, uh, Army. Uh, this is the aircraft carrier USS Lincoln, the second largest ship in the United States Atlantic Fleet. We are heading for maneuvers in the Gulf and are accompanied by three destroyers, four cruisers, two submarines and various other support vessels. As a member state of NATO, you are duty bound to assist us. So I say again, no, I command you, divert your course 15 degrees, that is one five degrees north, or countermeasures will be taken to ensure the safety of this ship. This is Lighthouse A835, Finisterre, your call. That's clearly an urban legend, as there are many different versions of it going around, uh, variously involving the British and the Irish, or the Spanish and the French, and so on. But nevertheless, the, the point the story makes stands. And that is, it doesn't matter who you are, or how big and impressive you claim to be. It doesn't even matter how powerful or what backing you have, you just can't bully an immovable object out of the way, can you? You can't argue with rock-solid facts, or, as in this case, just rock. No, you need to recognise that there could be those who have better vantage points, those who see the bigger picture, those who actually, because of their position and perspective, have more authority. And so you'd better know what or who you're dealing with before you make any rash comments or hasty judgments. Otherwise, well, at best, you'll be making yourself sound a bit foolish, or at worst, you'll stubbornly be heading for certain disaster. Now, the reason I mention this internet meme is because, in a way, it highlights the position that the Jewish religious leaders were taking here in John chapter 5. You see, if you were here with us last week, you'll remember that despite witnessing the miraculous healing of the man at the side of the pool in Bethesda, that the Jews, verse 10, which actually, if you look at your footnotes, is actually shorthand throughout this passage for the Jewish religious leaders. Well, these religious leaders were outraged by Jesus. They were offended by him, and so foolishly they began to challenge and verse 16, persecute him. So assured of their own position and authority, so busy defending God's laws, or at least their own interpretation of them, they completely missed the obvious. They missed the truth that this miraculous sign pointed to. Because as the sign shows, Jesus is actually the one in the position of strength. He is the one who has authority, the highest authority. Authority even over these religious leaders and their man-made rules. You see, by working a miraculous healing on the Sabbath, Jesus has proved that he is the one who completes God's work at verse 17 from last time. He is the one who can bring the promised Sabbath rest to all those who would come to him. Now, this itself is appointed to another reality, one that the religious leaders were loath to recognise. Because the only one who could do the work that Jesus was doing, the only one permitted to do God's work on the Sabbath, well, was God himself. 
As the religious leaders complain in verse 18 states, Jesus was making the outrageous claim that he had God's authority, that he was equal with God because he was God's own son. Jesus claimed he was God's own son. Now, back in the early 1990s, before many of you were born, it's crazy for me to say that these days, but it's getting more and more true. Now, the sports commentator, David Icke, was interviewed by Terry Wogan on his primetime Wogan show. And David Icke made the outrageous claim that the world was about to end, that tidal waves and earthquakes were about to devastate the UK. When Wogan asked for the basis for these claims, Ike replied that he was the son of God. That was his authority. Now, unfortunately for, for David Ike, this revelation didn't quite have the impact that he had expected. Uh, because rather than being impressed by his status or concerned about his claims, uh, Wogan and pretty much the whole studio audience were reduced to fits of laughter when Ike countered that laughter is actually the best way to remove negativity, uh, Wogan quipped, yes, but we're laughing at you, not with you. Now, I think that that has pretty much been the mainstream response to anyone who claims to be the son of God, right? Yeah, ridicule and laughter, or maybe concern for someone's mental health. No one who makes claims like that are ever taken seriously. But the thing is, in Jesus' day, to claim to be the Son of God was no laughing matter. In fact, in their worldview, claiming to be equal with God was heresy. It was blasphemy. It was punishable by death, hence the murderous intentions of the Jewish leaders there in verse 18. They wanted to kill Jesus. And yet Jesus, knowing the consequences of such a claim, knowing exactly how these leaders would, would respond, he nevertheless dared to make and defend the claim because as he explains to them, it's true. He is the Son of God. In fact, his distinct relationship with God reveals actually who should be calling the shots. He begins by stating that he is completely dependent on his Father. Now, the picture that Jesus paints in verse 19 is, is of a master craftsman and their apprentice, which of course in those days was very likely to be a father and son. Look at verse 19. Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. For the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing. Just imagine in a, in like a, a workshop, a craftsman, they're sharing his work with his apprentice, showing them how to do it, showing them all the, the tricks of the trade. Well, that's how God the Father is teaching and showing Jesus his works. Now, we spoke last week about the works of God, and they're often summarized in the Bible as God's provision and his salvation. And I'll admit now I mistakenly missed out creation, of course. But in all three of these major works, the Bible affirms that Jesus the Son shares with God the Father. As, God himself, as G, uh, John himself has already revealed in John chapter 1, Jesus was with God in the beginning. He was there at creation, not just passively watching God at work, but actively involved with his Father in creation. Remember John 1 verse 3, all things were made through him. So too is Jesus the Son active in God's provision as highlighted by the first sign, turning water into wine. In fact, we're going to learn even more about this in next week's encounter, where Jesus feeds the 5,000. Chiefly, though, as we've seen and learned throughout all these encounters with Jesus, he is the active element in God's salvation work. This is why Jesus can say that he does the Father's work. Jesus the Son does the Father's work. Never working independently from God, but working with his Father, working towards his Father's plans and purposes, working to please his Father, because actually, verse 20, his relationship with the Father is not comparable to that of a, a master and a slave or, or a teacher and a pupil. No, Jesus' relationship with God transcends all other relationships. It is a loving relationship between a father and a son, 
A father and a son united by love, united in love, working together towards their shared goals. And therefore, to carry out these shared works together, Jesus the Son has been equipped. He's been given power and authority by God the Father. Jesus explains there in verse 21 that this power has primarily been given for the giving of life. Look at what he says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Now we've come across this concept of life already a few times in John's Gospel. Just incidentally, the Greeks had a number of words to describe life. Uh, the main ones being bios, which is where we get the words biology, the study of life, and biography, that's someone's life writings. Uh, bios is generally used to describe physical life, kind of living things, hence biology. But a second word, the one that's used again and again by Jesus and John throughout his gospel, is zoe. Zoe. And it means, well, it means kind of like fullness of life. Uh, some have translated it simply as spiritual life, but, but it's much more than that because it's no less physical than bios life. Uh, the picture that we're getting built up in John's Gospel is that this life that Jesus offers is the best kind of life. The kind of life where you, know, you have a party that goes on forever with all that abundant wine. It is the full life. It's the kind of life, actually, that we'll experience with God in eternity. Which is why, for example, in verse 24, it's translated simply like that. Eternal life. Well, this is what Jesus is saying. Just as God the Father is the source of all life, and specifically this Zoe life, well, so the Father has given the Son power to bring this kind of life, even out of death. Jesus the Son holds the keys to life. He has the responsibility and the authority to decide who receives it. And God the Father has granted this task to Jesus' his Son, so that, verse 23, all may honour the Son, just as they honour the Father. And because it's the express will of the Father that all should honour the Son, Jesus continues, whoever does not honour the Son, does not honour the Father who sent him. This is the crux of the matter. This is the important point. This is what those religious leaders had completely missed. By standing in judgment of Jesus and dismissing his authority, they were in effect dismissing God and his authority. That's the reality of their situation. That's the scariness of their situation. They thought that through their obedience and religious observance that they were holding all the aces. They were the ones able to call all the shots. They were the ones, well, you know, like a captain of an aircraft carrier who could demand people do whatever they wanted. But Jesus reveals to him that actually, no, he's the one who's on solid ground. He's the one with a better vantage point. Consequently, he's the judge. And he's the rock that they must deal with one way or another. That's the scary bit, as, as Elliot was reading through. Do you see how many times Jesus says to them, you've rejected me, you're heading for trouble. You've rejected me, you're heading for trouble. And yet incredibly, graciously, despite what they may deserve, in this passage, Jesus still holds out the offer of life to anyone, even to these opponents who, at this point, refuse to recognize and honor him. Look at verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. You see, these are Jesus' words. This is what Jesus is saying. Whoever, that is anyone, anyone who hears Jesus' words and believes that he is who he says he is, believes that he is God's son, well, they will not stand condemned to death. Rather, they will be given life and life in all its fullness. Do you know, actually, this is such a rock-solid certainty that Jesus can say that effectively they've already passed from death to life. That the wheels of salvation have so firmly been put into motion by Jesus that verse 25, the time, the hour, his hour, was not simply coming, but effectively now come. 
Jesus is the Savior, and he will bring life to all of those, dead or alive, who have put their trust in him. So I reckon it's worth us just pausing and asking again, who is in charge? Who calls the shots? Who has the final say? Who has authority in your life? So I think even as Christians, like those religious leaders, we can easily say it's God. But in reality though, just like them, it's actually us who are still at the wheel. Us who are ploughing on regardless with our own plans and ideas. This passage makes us ask that question. It's just, it's just worth considering the direction we're taking. Are we unwittingly heading towards an unseen disaster? Or are we prepared to listen to, to submit to, and to change course according to Jesus and his authority? Because this encounter says that it doesn't matter who you are or how big and impressive you claim to be. Jesus is the ultimate authority. He is the judge. And his judgment is all that matters. And yet wonderfully it also tells us it doesn't matter who you are or how big and impressive you claim to be or not to be. He still holds out the offer of eternal life, fullness of life to anyone, to everyone who would come to him and believe. That is his offer. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you've done, you can still come and receive life from Jesus but I don't know about you but is that offer just too good to be true I mean that's a staggering claim isn't it whoever you are whatever you've done receive life is that just too incredible I mean we all know it's one thing to make a claim but another to back it up I mean after all David Icke made that grand claim but the problem he encountered is that he couldn't back them up he had no evidence except his own words And as Jesus himself says in verse 31, you can't confirm yourself. You can't corroborate yourself. No, you need witnesses. Well, in this final section of chapter 5, Jesus presents us with three reliable witnesses to his authority and to his ability to save. Three witnesses that corroborate all his claims. Three witnesses that should give us confidence in him. The first there is the personal testimony of John the Baptist. Now we thought about John the Baptist, who's not the same John who wrote this gospel a few weeks ago. That John burst onto the scene, preaching repentance and baptism, calling the people back to God, preparing them for the coming of the Lord. And John was widely accepted as a prophet. He was was legit, even by these religious leaders, verse 35. John was accepted as one who was sent by God. And John bore witness to the one who was coming who was greater than him. He bore witness to the Lamb of God who had come to take away the sins of the world. The one whose sandals John was unworthy to untie. The one whom John recognized must increase as he himself decreased. John's testimony at the witness statement that he gave there in verse 33 is that the greater one, the one with all authority, the one who is able to save the world and bring eternal life is none other than Jesus. That's what John the Baptist clearly said when he was questioned by the religious leaders in both chapters 1 and chapter 3. Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, the Saviour of the world. John is a reliable witness. But, verse 36, Jesus says, The testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. See what Jesus is saying, the signs, the miracles themselves, they witness to his power and authority. That the healing here in chapter 5 is only the third sign that's recorded in John's Gospel. If you remember, so far we've had the turning of water into wine, the healing of the official's son, and this healing of a man beside the pool. There are going to be four more signs revealed in John's gospel. But clearly Jesus can't use these signs that haven't been done yet as evidence. But as John himself says later in chapter 20 verse 30, these aren't the only signs, the only miracles that Jesus performed. No, Jesus did many other signs that are not recorded in this book. 
It's just that these ones have been selected by John to make his particular case. The Bible boffins reckon that by this point, Jesus had performed at least 17 miracles, including healings, the driving out of demons, the calming of the storm. In other words, by this time, Jesus had demonstrated his mastery and authority over the natural, the supernatural, and even the biological world. Now I reckon being able to perform one miracle would be, well, it'd be pretty noteworthy, wouldn't it? But being able to perform a catalogue of incredible, unexplainable, miraculous feats, well, they point to only one conclusion, don't they? As the kids' song goes, only God can do that. Jesus' authority is backed by the personal testimony of John the Baptist. It's backed by the historic evidence and the miracles he performed. But finally and conclusively, Jesus' authority is backed by the witness of Scripture. And this, he says, is the clincher. Because, verse 37, God's word, the Scriptures, bear witness to him. They testify that he is the one who can and will bring eternal life. You see, the whole of Bible history has been building a case that, that God would, would send a long-awaited saviour to deliver his people from their sins. So from the promise of a serpent crusher to Eve, through the promise of an eternal king on the throne to David, to the promise of a suffering servant in Isaiah, God has revealed his plans and his promises, his, his purposes and intentions in his word, through his word, and his word points to Jesus. And yet the religious leaders have missed it. Look at verse 39. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. The whole of scripture bears witness to Jesus. It, it points to Jesus. And yet these religious leaders had misinterpreted them. They'd misread them. Which is why they missed Jesus. They were too wrapped up in their own ideas in their own ideals, in their, in their religion and rules, that they couldn't see that everything they held dear, everything, their sacrificial system, their religion and rituals, the, the temple, the Torah, the law, the teaching of the prophets, the Psalms, the Proverbs, everything, all of it was just a shadow, a pointer, a promise of the one to come. Jesus Christ, verse 45, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father, there is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you've set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? See what Jesus is saying? It's possible to have all the evidence, all the witnesses, all just laid out before you and still miss the truth. It's possible even to search the scriptures, to, to read God's word diligently and yet not realize what it's saying, not see what it's all about, not realize that it points to Jesus. So guys, we're so privileged to have the Bible in our hands today. And through the Bible, we have the evidence and witness of the signs Jesus performed in the Gospels. We also have the personal witness of not just John the Baptist, but all the saints going back through history we have, we have all this evidence, all this proof of who Jesus is. So really, we have no excuse, no reason to miss reality. We can either submit ourselves to Jesus' authority, accept his word and believe and trust in him for life. Or we can blindly continue trusting ourselves, trusting our own perceptions, relying on our own interpretations. But, you know, to do that would be like, well... The captain of an aircraft carrier foolishly demanding that dry land get out of his way. Now, John chapter 5 shows us that Jesus is who he says he is. He is the Son of God. He is the Savior of the world. And therefore, he is the only one qualified, the only one capable, the only one willing to give us life. Therefore, there can be only one conclusion. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Listen to him. Yield your life to his authority. And you will have life. Life in all its fullness.
Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that Jesus is in charge. We thank you that he is judge. We thank you that he sees all and knows all. So we ask now that by the power of your spirit, you would give us humility to submit, submit ourselves to his authority. That we would gladly serve him instead of ourselves. And that through him we would receive life, eternal life, life in all its fullness. Father, that is, that is Jesus' promise to whoever would come to him. So Father, we thank you that you are trustworthy and true. And that promise is a guarantee to us. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Amen.